I am China Arnold. I am a mommy murderer. In 2005, I microwaved my 28-day-old baby for two minutes. Before I get into it, I would like to mention, this is not a true crime page. It's a horror page. Most importantly, it's my page, and I'll post whatever I want. If you don't like it, that's okay. But this isn't an airport. There is no need to announce your departure. Anyways. We were at the park one night. At some point during that night, Terrell Talley, my boyfriend, begins to question if Paris is truly his child. He had heard that I had been cheating on him. Questioning this made me really angry. We argued all the way home. At home, we got into a physical altercation in the driveway. At this point, I was incredibly inebriated, and he was not present in our apartment. Full of anger and resentment, I took our baby and placed her in the microwave. I set a timer on the microwave for pizza rolls and pushed start, allowing the microwave to run, with my baby girl inside, for at least two minutes. On August 30, 2005, around 7.15 am Terrell Talley, who was my boyfriend and I arrived in a rush at Children's Medical Center with our daughter, Paris Talley. Our baby had died before we arrived at the hospital, but we pretended not to be aware of that. Paris Talley had a temperature of 95 degrees, zero pulse, and there was no sign of respiration or blood pressure on her. Doctors and nurses at Children's Medical Center worked hard to revive her, but all the medical procedures to revive her failed. They declared her dead after 15 minutes of trying. I lied that she wasn't burned, but I couldn't give logical reasons why the baby had uncommon burns that looked nothing like scalding or the after-effects of liquid burns. It baffled the health workers that though there were multiple injuries on her body, the baby's nightgown was completely unsoiled by any form of bodily fluid. Matters surrounding our daughter's death would have ended almost as quickly as it had begun, but for the fact that it left the doctors and nurses in the dark. Doctors and nurses knew there was more to the baby's death, but they knew neither the actual cause of death nor how cruel it was. When questioned further about what had happened, I lied that I arrived home at 2 a.m., tried to feed Paris, and discovered that she couldn't take in the food. I told the health workers that later that night, Paris felt warm when I touched her, so I placed her in a bassinet and put a fan on her. And in the morning, when Paris wasn't getting any better, I called my boyfriend and we drove down to the hospital for help. Our lies and pretense were well acted out, but they didn't succeed in fooling the health workers. We were later taken to the police station for interrogation. At the police station, we maintained their lies and we almost got away with the infanticide. During interrogations at the police station, we continued to feign innocence, our accounts of how the baby died varied, but we were careful enough not to say anything incriminating. I told them I couldn't find my baby when I woke up in the morning, but wasn't worried because I thought Tally had Paris in the bassinet upstairs. He claimed he came home between 3 o'clock and 4 a.m., slept on the couch next to me, and woke up in the morning to a dead baby. The police knew the baby had been burned, but they weren't quite sure how. They searched our home and talked to our neighbors. That didn't reveal enough relevant details about the supposed mysterious burns on our baby and the death. We were released several days after police investigations failed to clear the dark cloud that enveloped the cause of our baby's death. After our release, we left the home. Our relocation would have buried the case out and out if we hadn't left the microwave behind. Another reason we almost got away at first was that at the time of the initial investigations, the coroner wasn't aware that people do actually kill babies by microwaving them. Surprise! In early 2006, the news about a baby that had been microwaved in Virginia made it to the headlines and refreshed the case. Investigators found patterns that helped crack the case when they compared the Virginia incident with mine. On May 18, 2006, the investigators returned to our home at 415 Hall Avenue, Dayton, Ohio, for a search, hoping to make relevant discoveries that will confirm the validity of the patterns they had observed. I am now serving life in prison. Happy Mother's Day!
Have you ever heard of Gilly Raubel, seen here? She was the half-niece of Hitler and his apparent romantic obsession. She was also found dead with a shotgun wound to her chest at the age of just 23, and her death was never seriously investigated. To this day, it is a mysterious, almost unsolved case, so let's look at it. Gilly was born in 1908, and her mother, Angela, shared a father with Hitler, which is why she was a half-niece of Hitler. When Gilly was just two years old, her father died unexpectedly, and so she was brought up by her mother, Angela. And then in 1925, Hitler uh, appointed Angela, so that's Gilly's mother, as his housekeeper, and so the family sort of moved in with Hitler. At this time, Gilly was just 17, whilst Hitler was 39. And weirdly, he just completely fell in love with her, like absolutely obsessively in love. It seems that Gilly was young and free and fun, and this really attracted Hitler to her presence. Hitler also once remarked, though, that a girl of 18 to 20 is as malleable as wax. It should be possible for a man, whoever the chosen woman may be, to stamp his own imprint on her. That's all the women asked for. So this is all taking place as Hitler was gaining more and more power in the lead up to the 1930s. Hitler became increasingly controlling and possessive over his half-niece, and he would also take her to all of his meetings and parties. She basically never left his side. Hitler was also um, very controlling about who she could see romantically, and he ended any relationship that she struck up with somebody. He essentially wanted her all to himself, and so slowly but surely this bubbly, vivacious young girl started to feel more and more claustrophobic in this sort of weird relationship. There were, of course, rumours that it was a sexual relationship, and that there were other rumours that Gilly was actually turning away from Hitler because he was making her do perverted stuff that she didn't want to. Of course, over time, it became more and more burdensome to be this sort of object of obsession. And indeed, Gilly became more and more sort of oppressed by this awful kind of burdensome relationship. And then on the 19th of September 1931, when she was just 23, she was found dead. It was initially touted as suicide, and it was said that she'd shot herself in the chest. But apparently she and Hitler had quarrelled the night before, and this was actually a regular occurrence. But others think that she was murdered because she knew too much. She knew about Hitler's hopes and ambitions. She knew about his sexual fantasies. She knew so much that could derail his campaign to gaining more power. Hitler was apparently absolutely devastated by her death. And yet it was pretty much covered up. You can see there's four men there with hoods on, they've got face coverings, and they're armed with a machete, a baton, and a rifle. They repeatedly try and enter through the front. Three of them work together, in fact, to pull away the fly screen door. Then one of them repeatedly kicks open that front door. Once they're inside, there are shots that are fired. They speak to three occupants who are inside who say they don't have any drugs or cash on premises. Then all three are assaulted. Then they locate a safe, they steal jewellery, and they also steal the Volkswagen Polo parked out the front, which has later been found burnt out. Imagine murdering your husband because he had an affair. Trigger warning for graphic content. Bill Hall was a self-made millionaire who lived in San Antonio, Texas with his wife that he was married to for 30 years and his two children. Him and his wife, Frances, met in high school and they had been together ever since. However, Bill had a secret and his secret's name was Bonnie Contreras. The two met one day when Bonnie was working at a spinach festival and she was selling chicken on a stick. They locked eyes and started their relationship. According to Bonnie, she had asked Bill if he was married and Bill responded by saying he was, but that he was getting a divorce. Bonnie said that she no longer questioned him afterwards even though they did it for three years because she said it was none of her business. Throughout the years, Bill showered Bonnie with gifts. He bought her multiple luxury vehicles, would pay her rent, got her a breast augmentation, took her on lavish trips, and much more. According to Bonnie, her and Bill were in love, but according to Bill's friends, he wanted out of the relationship. There was just one problem. Bonnie had a lot to use for blackmail against Bill if he wanted to get out of the relationship. And she ended up going through with this. 
The reason Frances even found out about the affair was because Bonnie personally reached out to Frances. She started sending them SEX tapes of her and Bill and started attacking Frances, calling her every mean word in the book. She wanted to make sure that Frances knew that her and Bill had been having an affair for years. He turned me into a woman that I wasn't before I met him. I started falling in love. I started warming up to him, warming up to his ways, to his um, fetishes, to his um, flaws. You know, I warmed up to it all. On October 13th, 2013, Frances would see her husband's mistress for the very first time on Loop 1604 in San Antonio. Frances, Bill's wife, was leaving her niece's volleyball game when she spotted Bill on his Harley Davidson being followed by a Range Rover that belonged to Frances. And Bonnie, the mistress, was the one driving Frances's car her new Range Rover. Frances made a U-turn in her Cadillac Escalade and started to follow Bonnie. According to Bonnie, who was the mistress, Frances hit the back of her car over 15 times. You can see in this photo right here where everybody was. It is believed that Bill was following a little too closely to Frances, and some say that she purposely swerved to hit him, while others believe that she was so caught up after Bonnie that she didn't even realize that she hit her husband. Bill was sent flying and would end up passing away in the hospital due to his injuries. In court, Bonnie testified against Frances, saying that she knew exactly what she was doing with her vehicle to get rid of Bill. She felt betrayed. She felt embarrassed. Do I understand all of those things? Absolutely, I do. I'm a woman. I understand when a woman goes into a rage and wants to do bad things. But contain yourself, you know? Her turning that vehicle around, that was her decision. However, Frances stated that she had absolutely no idea she had hit him. I will love him till the day I die. Texas has a law called sudden passion, which is exactly what Frances got charged with, and she was sentenced to two years in prison. In 2016, the mistress Bonnie sued the Hall family for emotional distress damages and was seeking $2.5 million. There is very limited information regarding whether she won the lawsuit or not on the internet, so I have no idea if she did. As for Frances, she was released from prison on September 7th, 2018. Very curious to hear what y'all's thoughts are on this case. Do y'all believe that it was an accident or do you believe it was intentional please remember to always stay respectful in the comment section these are real people real cases real situations black women we have got to stop laying with men who hurt children this is unacceptable so y'all are looking at stephen beckley in 1994 he walked a 16 year old child to a grave that was previously dug for her then proceeded to take turns bashing her over the head with a shovel then they buried her alive. Her cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head and asphyxiation, and medical examiners think that she may have woken up in her grave. Prior to that, he assisted in her abduction from Texas. They drove to Arkansas, purchased a motel, and then took turns sexually assaulting her. Lisa Renee wanted to be a doctor. Straight A student, wouldn't hurt a fucking fly had nothing to do with the original crime that they were going to commit, which was murdering her brother. This case caused a whole visceral reaction in my body. It does take a lot to make my jaw drop because all I do is true crime. I host a true crime podcast. But reading what Lisa Renee went through when they strapped her to that chair and brutalized her, her praying to God to get her out of this situation, her begging for her life, from point A to point B. Black women stop choosing men who hurt children. Eight billion people on this planet. I, I ain't got no more, I ain't got no more. A 10 year old boy only weighing 36 pounds was found wandering the streets by his neighbor. He was barefoot, very confused and hungry. He told the neighbor that he was walking to the gas station to get food and he begged to not be taken back to his home. District attorney's voice cracked uh, as she described uh, the condition that this 10 year old boy was in. In fact, the case is so egregious that the parents have been charged with attempted murder in this case and defects has come in to take custody 
custody of the other four children. Let's take a look at the parents in this case. They are the suspects. They are Tyler and Krista Shinley. The DA says they were arrested on Friday after their 10-year-old son was found hungry and wandering in the streets. They say at that time he only weighed 36 pounds and he begged the neighbor who found him not to take him back to his home. The DA believes that neighbor may have saved his life. It is my true belief that had um, had he not gotten out of the home, that this case would be a very different one. A lot of paper for these for these investigators. A lot of work. A lot of interviews. Um, in child abuse cases, we need pediatric records. We need school records. We need defects records. We need interviews with everybody that had any contact with this child. If there are other people that had contact with him. Something just wasn't right. I mean, you know, it's just uh, the lack of communication. You know, our other neighborhood here, people are more friendly. Um, I'm not really saying they weren't friendly, but they were not sociable at all. And take a look now. This is the family's home in the Westminster Hills subdivision. Uh, the DA tells us that there was reason to believe that that child was being held in that home. We ask if there were locks on the door. She did not want to go into details, but we are told that 10 year old is in a second hospital now in stable condition. Uh, the DA says he was suffering from not only malnutrition, but also a very low heart rate. But right now they are saying that he is stable we will have much this is the story of the real life gone girl so have you heard of sherry papini sherry and keith papini married in october of 2009 and everything seemed to be going very well for them together they had two children a boy and a girl and their life just seemed to be going very well until november 2nd of 2016 when keith arrived back at home and realized sherry wasn't there and neither were their kids Keith soon realized that Sherry had never picked up the kids from daycare and this was very unusual. He was unable to locate his wife so he finally used uh, Find My iPhone and that's when he discovered that her uh, phone and her headphones were locating about a mile away from their house. It was at this point that Keith decided to call police and that's when a massive search for Sherry started. Missing person posters were posted everywhere and Keith and a lot of people helped search for Sherry, but three weeks would go by and there would be no sight of her. That was until about three weeks later on Thanksgiving Day when Sherry was finally released. She was found about 150 miles away from their home. Sherry and her family lived in Redding, California, and she was found 150 miles away on a very busy highway on the side of the highway. When Sherry was found, she had several severe bruises all over her body. Her long blonde hair had also been cut incredibly short and she was also branded on her right shoulder and she only weighed about 87 pounds. Sherry told investigators that she had been abducted by two Hispanic women who kept their faces covered the entire time. She also said that they spoke Spanish a lot, so she wasn't able to understand them. She also told investigators that she had been um, pretty severely beaten by her abductors and so that explained all of the bruises. Sherry was eventually released to go home, but investigators would come to her home on several occasions to try to interview her. She was very reluctant to speak to them though. Sherry told investigators that her abductors had said that they were going to sell her to uh, traffickers and that these traffickers were also in the law enforcement. So she said she wasn't sure if she could trust the law enforcement officers that were at her house interviewing her. There were also uh, several sketches released of the women that Sherry said she had been abducted by and this caused a lot of anxiety in some uh, communities because there were some Hispanic women who were afraid that they would look like these sketches when they had nothing to do with Sherry's abduction. Keith was even a suspect for a while, but he did offer to do a polygraph test, but when it came to the investigation, police were pretty tight-lipped about what they were looking into. But investigators were kind of skeptical about Sherry's case because she kept having different answers about why her abductors had branded her, like her stories would change. I am going to have to go to part two, but it is up and it should be down in the comments. So here's part two to the real life Gone Girl. 
As the investigation into Sherry's disappearance continued, police did ask for the clothes that she was wearing so that they could test for any uh, biological material on her clothing. They did find male DNA on her clothing, but when they sent it out for DNA testing, there were absolutely no matches in their system. Looking at Sherry's phone records, they were able to see that she had been in contact with several men before her disappearance. They then talked to Sherry's ex-husband, who did tell investigators that Sherry had a tendency to lie and then run away. The case was pretty slow going until 2020 when they used an Ancestry website to test the male DNA that they had found on Sherry's clothes. The man's name was James Reyes and he at first said that he had not had contact with Sherry for several years, but then later he confessed that Sherry had told him that Keith was being abusive towards her and that she wanted to come stay with him. James then told investigators that Sherry had told him to rent a car and come pick her up. He did that and then she had stayed with him for three weeks. James also said that the bruises on Sherry's body were largely self-inflicted but that she had asked him to hurt her. Sherry was also the one that asked James to brand her. It was on Thanksgiving Day that Sherry told James that she missed her kids and wanted to go home so he dropped her off on the side of the busy highway. This is when investigators decided to interview Sherry one more time and they told Sherry that James had told them everything. So finally she relented and told the truth. And in March, she was arrested for uh, mail fraud and making false claims. The investigation into Sherry's disappearance cost taxpayers about $300,000. So the judge also said that she needed to pay that back. But not only that, Sherry was able to get disability for what had happened to her and also uh, got some money from victims' boards. Keith would separate from her as soon as she was charged and then filed for divorce and asked for sole custody of their two children. There is so much wrong with this case, especially the anxiety that it caused in the Hispanic women's community. Like, it was just completely unnecessary. And on top of that, she got a lot of money from different victims' uh, associations and from disability and all those things. I think she should pay back a whole lot more than $300,000. But what are your thoughts on this case? Do you think it was a harsh enough punishment for what she did? Let me know down in the comments and follow for more true crime. No, I don't want her to. I just called Jason to see where they were at with progress and the labor and if Kylan has started pushing yet. And... I was told that Jason is still not letting Kylan have the epidural. Oh. I don't know why Jason's acting like this right now. I really don't. Um, I think part of it could be, you know, that this is his baby too, and he just wants to do what's best for his son. He just doesn't understand. If the epidural was a bad thing, they wouldn't be offering it to people. But I don't think it's Jason's decision on if Kylan gets her the epidural or not. I think that's up to Kylan and what she wants. It's her body. She's going through the labor. He needs to just calm Jason needs to just stop being an and he needs to just let Kylan get this epidural. You know, she's young, she's scared. She's has no idea what she's doing right now. They didn't take any classes and for her to have to be dealing with Jason acting the way he's acting right now, I feel bad for her. Kylan, if you want the epidural, you get the epidural. I don't want Jason to be a 
doesn't matter. Jason, I'm sorry. I love you. But Kylan, you gotta think about you and your son right now. It's my son. How do you not see that I'm exhausted? I do. I mentally we have the same physically amount of sleep. cannot do it. Push. It doesn't matter. She's been going through this. This is way more exhausting for her right now than it is on you. I'm sorry. I, I gotta go. We'll see. Usually I can't speak up for myself, but now I am because I'm finally pissed off enough. I'm speaking up. I'm getting laughed at. I don't give a f what you think anymore. Please come Please. Please not get the epidural? No. Then no. That's literally childish. Look at you, you're already high. There's no drugs going into her arm, Jason. It's only IV fluid. The nurses gave me an option to take an epidural or not. And, yeah. Why don't you just say it? No, because I'd just rather not talk about it so we don't fight. If you lie and act like you did nothing wrong and make me look like a piece of when you were the piece in the situation, then I will get mad. I was in a lot of pain, so I decided to get the epidural. Okay, Kylan, act like it's just fine. Hello. They said you wanted an epidural. Do you know what an epidural is? The beauty of it is you get to go to sleep until it's time to push, and you can get some good pain control for pushing. I don't give you consent to give us much time. Well, it's her body, and your son is in her body. She consented. Why would you consent? Sometimes you just gotta let things go, buddy, you know? The decision's made, it's her decision, it's not yours to make. We had a birth plan. I told you before we went to the hospital, in the hospital, so many times I begged you not to do it, and you took me out of the situation. No, I wasn't trying to take you out. Well, I was out of the situation. So the worst part about this is the numbing medicine, all right? It's just a pinch and a burn. It takes a couple of seconds to go away. I don't consent to this. It's my kid, too. Uh, this has nothing to do with your kid. This has to do with her body right now for pain reduction. You have a limited understanding of what's actually occurring here. So you starting to feel a little numb and tingly in your legs yet? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I think she's a Because she had a stick of needle with epidural in her back that has oxycodone, methamphetamine, it has all kinds of drugs in it. Do you have that one friend that is like super obsessed with like true crime and crime scene shows? Or is that you? Are you one that stays up late at night and watches like crime shows? This is the perfect bath bomb set. All I need, all I need, all I need. Let me tell you what you need to hear. Cause I need you close, I need you near Let me tell you what you need to hear Cause I need you close, I need you near You, you're all I need You, you're all I see When I close my eyes and dream You're all I see Sure, all I need, all I need, all I need Mariana